I would like to actually now, if I could, have the opportunity to officially welcome you to the summit. Uh, and uh, so, we, so we are at the Indian American uh, Impact Project Summit. Uh, we thought about calling it uh, Daisy Jam 2018. The, the, uh, well, the subtitle is The Rise of the Brown. Um, but then Steve Bannon called us, and um, you know, he said he'd pick it in, and then we said, well, that'd be good for press, so should we do that? Uh, but then evidently he's in Italy doing his thing. So, um, so unfortunately, we were left with this name of, of the summit, um, but, but we, did, we, did, we did play with that. Uh, but I do just want to, for the record, state, because it hasn't been stated yet, that we are the largest gathering of Indian American elected officials in the history of the United States of America right here. And Canada. And what, I, and what I'd like to do is, of course, tell you officially what is impact. Um, you know, again, because of schedule, we weren't able to do that. So, to just for the record, we are a new C3 organization, co-founded by Deepak Raj, who you'll hear from shortly, uh, and myself. Um, uh, and I chair the C3 board, and Deepak chairs the PAC board, which we'll talk about. And the mission is, is simple, which is that we want to have a network of candidates and elected and elected and um, and community organizers to work on behalf of the community. We want to produce research. We want to actually run conventions like this. And the real essence, and Ro obviously talked about it, Ami talked about it, is to build infrastructure in this community which we so badly need. Um, so as I mentioned, the Impact Fund, which Deepak chairs, uh, is also designed to do political work, which is actually to help elect and invest in campaigns and candidates who are viable and reflect our values. Uh, I should also point out that we have a terrific board. They are in your program, but uh, I feel compelled to recognize them and thank them. Dine Talampali, Ravi Akuri, Raghu Deva Guptapu, uh, Priya Dayananda, Mini Timaraju. Uh, we really, we thank you so very much for, uh, for, for your board service. Uh, and we also need to thank, many of you in this room know Gotham Raghavan. I'm sure he's busy on his iPhone. Uh, thank you, Gotham. Give him a round of applause. Gotham, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, a, 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 one of the aspects of the outcome of the November 2016 election is that there were many Democrats who needed a job. Uh, so we were very, very happy that uh, Gotham was available and he's really the transformational person who's put this whole thing together. And I should also be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of you who are as grizzled, grizzled veteran as I am uh, remember the Indian American Leadership Initiative. Uh, which was IALI, and we really do stand on their shoulders. That was an organization that wasn't able to scale, but did incredible amounts of work through conferences and convenings like this, and we learned a lot of lessons from them. So a quick little bit of statistics. We've got, obviously, you know, the five members of the U.S. Uh, of the US Congress, but we have had record number of Indian Americans in the Obama administration. In November of 2017, so the off-year elections that were six months ago, 25 Indian Americans won around the country, a majority of them women. And yes, please. We have, we have 90 candidates who are Indian American who are running for office this cycle. And I think it is not too much to think that in 2020, there could be one, maybe even two, Indian American viable candidates for the presidency of both parties. Uh, so yes, please. And I do just want to say, because people have very nicely said, congratulations, thank you for organizing this, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, what was the motivation for this? And if you'll indulge me, I'll just say personally, I, have, I was a former elected official, and I was, um, I remember when Aziz put me in India abroad, I couldn't agree more with Roe, I mean, to this day, I mean, uh, my parents still have, I think they have the cutting on the, uh, you know, they don't even have their granddaughters on their uh, refrigerator, it's my picture of the Democratic Convention, and the only thing I think I did was answer the phone for those four days, uh, but having a brown intern at a national convention was newsworthy for Aziz at the time. And fast forward 20 years later, when, uh, 10 years later, I shouldn't date myself too much, uh, I am working as one of the early staffers of the Center for American Progress. And I have an enviable Beltway job. I'm working for John Podesta. We're at the, uh, if you happen to be a Democrat, we were really fighting at that time the Iraq War invasion and the Bush administration. But something inside me, just like Roe articulated, I thought, could I do, actually do a little bit more? And I have to say, because I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, I always assumed I'd be the campaign manager for my good buddies who were white guys who grew up in Wichita. And it took me a lot of time, just like Roe, to internalize the notion that I could be the principal. And so that envisioning process is really important. That shouldn't have been the case. 
And that's why a huge reason as to why we did this. And then we come back to tactics. So I thought I knew politics. I had a fancy Harvard Law degree. I, you know, I was a religious C-SPAN junkie. I could argue at a bar in DC. I could tell you who the deputy chief of staff and the caucus minority, blah, blah, blah. And then I got to Wichita. I went back home to Wichita to be with my parents. And I realized I didn't know a damn thing, actually, about our American political system. I had never knocked a door. I had never raised a dollar. I had never dealt with the unbelievable amount of advice you get. I always joke that you know nobody goes to a brain surgeon and says, you know, you missed a capillary when you were in there. Uh, but somehow when you run for office, people are like, you know, the way to win this election is to wear purple on Thursdays. And, uh, and if you do that, you win by 80-20. And so a huge skill set is to, is to manage all of this incoming advice you get because it's political life and it's democracy. And I didn't know any of that. And so I thought that we should have an institution that makes nobody have to learn that from scratch. And that, was a, and that was a huge motivation there. And then people have mentioned it, if you look at our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community, in the African American community, in the Latino community, in the Armenian community, in the Greek community, all have institutions like impact because it is basic infrastructure that you need for a community to advance. So we define success and impact in the following way. It's pretty simple. There should, any Indian American in this country should have no doubt that they can run for office, that voters will vote for them, and that they can make an impact when they're in office. And it's as simple as that. So um, I would like to say, if you'll, uh, as, we're, as we're waiting for our next speaker, I will say that I am kind of a, a geek of history. And uh, some of you may know, uh, Mario Cuomo gave a very famous keynote at the Democratic Convention in 1984, and he talked about the arc of the 20th century, about how Roosevelt and Kennedy had lifted up and had been inspirations for this country and, and for the world. And I think what's interesting about our history as a community is that people don't appreciate. Uh, Samit Malik, I think, is here from the South Asian American Digital Archive at Penn, an amazing organization. He educated me that the first Indians in this country were in the 1890s, brought here to work on the farms in California. And then like a power Daisy move, they ended up owning the farms. But that's, you know, that, but that's just what we do. Uh, but it was a fascinating uh, education. And in 1908, there were riots against Hindus in Washington state. And in 1917, the immigration law of this country banned, banned completely, prohibited any immigrants from the subcontinent. And so imagine that, and 40 years later, you know, history is not linear, it goes in spurts. In fact, Dr. King talked about that in the I Have a Dream speech. He was inspired by Gandhi, of course. And history, and President Obama, of course, exemplifies that. It goes in spurts and jumps, and sometimes it goes backwards, and sometimes it goes forwards. It took 40 years after they banned migrants from the subcontinent for the Leap Singh Sound to have the temerity to become a local judge in California, and in 1956, become the first Asian American elected to the national office in the history of this country. Yeah! There we go, all right, there we go. And if you can imagine he did that when there were not even remotely the numbers we had, so the real immigrant wave started in the 60s and the 70s. That's, for me, that's my parents coming in 1970. I see so many young people, there may be your grandparents who immigrated to this, to this country, which is remarkable. And what we see in that history is that it takes a long time, and as uh, Ami and Roe mentioned, the second generation is now, in fact, President Obama mentioned this to, us, to some of us just today, that once the first generation establishes itself, now it's time for the second and third generations to really step up and, uh, and engage in the political space. So it really is, at the end of the day, Roe mentioned this about our values. I think even though our values seem to be under assault by the tweet of the day, I think there is nothing more American than a community organizing like itself, like we are right now. And I think it's also important that we not just focus on the political operatives and the business people in this room. We have a very diverse community out there. So I really, when I think about why we started this, I think about Bobir Singh Sodhi, murdered after 9-11 in Arizona for the crime of wearing a turban. You think about the victims in Oak Creek worshiping at a good war of, murdered for the notion that they worship a god different than their neighbors. And how about one year ago, where Srinivas Kochabutla in Kansas City gets murdered for the audacity to have a drink with his friend at a bar in Kansas City. And so to me, all of those things are why we do impact. Political power does not prevent those atrocities. It does not change madness or hatred. 
but it puts a face on this country and changes exactly the very essence of what we think about this country. Never again, I have two young girls, will they, my children think it's strange to have a beautiful black family in the White House. That's the power of what President Obama did for this country and for this world, and I think it's the power of what we can do here. So, you know, when I think about my mother, coming as a young female doctor in this country, unable to hear her mother's voice for four years because the phone calls were so expensive that all she could do was telegram back to Batinda and Punjab. And I think about Kamala Harris's mom who had the audacity to have an interracial marriage and raise two beautiful women and now one of them may become president of the United States of America. That to me is really the values that animate why we started Impact and why we're at this inflection point now. So as I just conclude, I would like to say in my adopted home state of New York, I'm now a proud New Yorker for eight years, we have this motto, which is, as you know, uh, the motto is Excelsior. And I thought it was Hindi. Uh, evidently it's not, it's actually Latin. Um, but Excelsior stands for ever upward. And again, Governor Cuomo used to talk about this, but what an awesome slogan for who we are as a community ever upward, always aspirational, some steps back, but always steps forward. We started with a ban on immigrants from our, from our, from you know the, the motherland of where we come from, to then having a member of Congress. It took 40 years, now we have five, and eventually we will go from City Hall to the White House, and with your help, we'll get that done. So we are very, very excited that you're here today, and I appreciate you hearing those remarks, so thank you.